The story of the kings and queens of England is more surprising than you might think. It's a fine drama, a thousand years of tales of lust and betrayal, of heroism and cruelty, of mysteries, murders, tragedies, and triumphs. The story of the Stuarts is, when you think about it, the most surprising of all. It's the story of a country deciding that it should abolish the monarchy and become a republic. And then, without any outside force or pressure, overthrowing the republic and making itself a monarchy again. That never happened anywhere else. Why did it happen here? James became King of Scotland when his mother Mary fled to England in 1567. He was one year old when he was crowned James VI. He grew up learning how to steer a path between religious fanatics and the violent Scottish nobility, and at the same time acquired a serious scholarly education. He was very proud of that. He pleaded for his mother's life, but accepted the fact of her execution by the English Queen Elizabeth. Business was business, and he had no memory of Mary. He'd been taught that she was a scarlet woman, and she had, after all, murdered his father and taken a lover. He was the recognized heir to the English crown, and he wasn't going to put that in danger. And so in 1603, when Elizabeth the Virgin Queen eventually died, the oldest monarch England had ever had, he came from Edinburgh to London for his coronation. He was openly bisexual. The word in London was that Elizabeth had been a king. And now they had James the Queen. In Latin, of course. By the accident of heredity, England and Scotland were now united in a single kingdom, Britain. Everyone had high hopes of James, especially the Roman Catholics, who thought that his distaste for bossy Scottish Presbyterians would encourage him to lift Elizabeth's restraints on their worship. They were wrong about that. So, a group of well-connected Roman Catholic terrorists planned to blow up the entire political structure at the opening of Parliament in 1605. They brought over an explosives expert from the Low Countries. He organized placing two and a half tons of gunpowder in a cellar under the Palace of Westminster. It's a sign of how secure England became that for the last 200 years, November the 5th, the anniversary of Guy Fawkes' capture, has been simply an excuse for a fun night of pretty explosions. A chilling resonance. Al-Qaeda terrorism has tainted many people's idea of Muslims, which perhaps makes it easier to understand how Fawkes' terrorism affected people's idea of Roman Catholics. Actually, James himself was more sympathetic to high church than to low, because the followers of Protestant sects did not want priests and bishops to do religion on their behalf. In the Protestant view, the godly man has his own Bible, the devil's agent is a priest with a Catholic prayer book. James felt that people who didn't have respect for hierarchy in church would be equally disrespectful of authority in general. No bishop, no king was his fear. And the authority of the king was very dear to him. He spelled out his ideology in masks, theatrical balls, in his new banqueting house in Whitehall. His intellectual take on the job was that he was God's deputy and that he ruled by divine right as the absolute sovereign power in England. Having been raised in Scotland, he was baffled by the idea of common law, the notion that law was in the hearts and minds of the people, expressed through the precedents of the courts and their juries of ordinary folk. But this was the essence of the English system. It had been essential for the Normans to operate that way, as foreign rulers in a land they didn't know, and it had become embedded in the fabric of English life. Henry VIII and Elizabeth had the position of tyrants, but their tyranny required popular consent. They had to be popular in order to rule. James wasn't good at being popular. He was head of a court, a place of factions and favourites, and was grand in a very private way. One example of his sense of power and duty was in his treatment of tobacco. It had been introduced from America by Walter Raleigh, and Elizabeth had felt rather alarmed by it. It made her feel ill. She bet Raleigh that he couldn't weigh the smoke that came out of a pipe. Raleigh knew how to perform. 
He weighed an ounce of tobacco, smoked it, weighed the ash, and the missing weight was the smoke. Elizabeth laughed and paid up, saying she'd seen men turn their gold into smoke, but this was the first time she'd seen smoke turn to gold. James's whole approach was different. He disliked smoking and felt it was his duty to protect his subjects. But he was a rational man, a teacher, so he wrote a pamphlet, Counterblast to Tobacco, explaining that it was loathsome to the eye, hateful to the nose, harmful to the brain, dangerous to the lungs, and in the black, stinking fume thereof. He wanted to persuade people by the force of his argument, so he published it anonymously. Of course, no one took any notice. So, as the wise and kindly father of his people, he banned the growing of tobacco in England and increased the customs duty on tobacco by 4,100%. And reissued the pamphlet with his name on it. His whole approach was based on rational thought, not an English habit, and what he saw as the absolute authority of a king, also rather foreign to them. And his authority was not backed by any army, and his income was too small to run both the court and the government. The regular royal income came from rents on lands, feudal dues, and customs duties. But the flood of gold and silver coming to Europe from the New World had created inflation, reducing the real value of that income. Medieval government was designed for rather static farming economies and vast estates. Towns, run by common folk with special liberties granted in charters, had been useful little add-ons. But now international and intercontinental trade had blossomed. The nobles had declined, the towns had become major financial centers. Inflation, the growth of Protestantism, a lack of respect for traditional authority, the emergence of assertive members of parliament, none of this was restricted to England. But in England it had a slightly different flavor. Everywhere else the ruler made the law, he was the law, but not in England. Kingship existed under the law. James simply didn't understand this. He was certain that the job of king meant being above the law. And being James, he not only understood this was the problem, but said so as a matter of principle. And when the Lord Chief Justice disagreed, the Lord Chief Justice got the sack. James was, people said, the wisest fool in Christendom. He needed to raise taxes, but taxation was always regarded as a special event. Taxes might be levied if there was an emergency need for cash, but the law said that this could not be done without the agreement of Parliament, which gave the Commons the chance to present demands to him. They expected what was called redress of grievances before granting him supplies, and these were exactly the kind of people who tended to be Puritans, low church, with no real sense of proper deference to people better born than themselves. So he avoided that as much as possible. His way of life didn't help either. His diversions were hunting, an obsession, and took up with a pretty young Scot who'd been his page. Robert Carr was given the estate of the executed Walter Raleigh and quickly became a Viscount and a Privy Councillor. When Carr decided to wed the married 17-year-old Countess of Essex, who hated her husband, James helped to sort out the divorce. The Countess's family, the Howards, detested Carr, but realized this was the best way to get into favor at court. Carr's close friend, Sir Thomas Overbury, tried to warn him off that filthy base woman, which annoyed the Countess. So the sweet young couple poisoned Sir Thomas, which opened the door eventually to the Howards' enemies, who exposed the murder plot to James, while providing him with another very beautiful young man, George Villiers, to take Carr's place. Carr and his wife were sentenced to death, and Villiers, whose legs were wonderful, became the Duke of Buckingham, and the murderous couple were pardoned. James wasn't exactly a Puritan's role model. By the time King James died, aged 58, in 1625, the King and the Puritans were set on course for a direct collision, and his son Charles wasn't going to change direction. The new king was 25 years old, Gauche with a nervous stammer, but deeply conscious of his place as God's anointed ruler of Britain, the new father figure, 
and he played the part of absolute ruler as well as he possibly could. Of course, it was not the part that the Puritan merchants and gentry wanted played. They refused to grant taxes without being allowed a role in government, so Charles tried to manage on the sources of revenue that didn't need parliamentary approval. The most celebrated example was when he levied ship money. An ancient law was unearthed obliging seaports to provide ships in times of war. True, there was no war, but there were pirates, weren't there? In 1634, Charles made his demand and told the ports they could pay cash instead, ship money. This engraving was published to make people proud of paying up. And then the next year, he extended the demand to inland communities. Otherwise, it would be unfair. It was obvious that if he got away with this, he'd have reinvented taxation under another name and would never need Parliament at all. The entire nation had steam coming out of its ears. One wealthy Buckinghamshire man, John Hampden MP, refused to pay and was hauled into the Court of Exchequer. Hundreds of people tried to jam into the court to watch. Of the 12 judges, seven found for the king and five for Hampden. Since the king had thought he controlled the judiciary, this was a moral victory for the church. He regarded Puritanism as fundamentally seditious, which made many people think he was really a closet Roman Catholic. He wasn't, but he was determined to impose a uniform system of worship which was decidedly high church. And that simply added to the anger of a growing Puritan class. In Scotland, it was met by direct rebellion. Without the money to hire reliable troops, and with popular hostility in London making life positively dangerous, Charles had to accept restrictions on his power which were to him intolerable. In 1641, he agreed acts of Parliament which took many powers from him, including the right to dissolve Parliament and the right to raise customs duties without its consent. In January 1642, in a state of confused desperation, he tried to arrest five members of the Commons by actually turning up there with armed guards. He failed, and faced with violent anger in the streets, he fled from London. In November, the now inevitable civil war began. People were called upon to choose between their King's determination to break the pretensions of Parliament and Parliament's determination to limit the power of the King. Most people actually didn't think they wanted to get involved. But the war grew with a murderous logic of its own and gradually became more bitter and more inescapable. It's now reckoned that possibly a quarter of a million people died in battle, of starvation, of disease, as a result of the fighting, out of a population of about five million. That's a far higher death rate than in the First World War. When the war ended in 1646 with the defeat of Charles's forces, an attempt was made to negotiate a settlement, but Charles was a dishonest negotiator, simply using this opportunity to try and organize the conquest of England from Ireland and Scotland. And then something quite new happened. In the brief and decisive Second War, the parliamentary army developed a revolutionary will of its own. When Charles was recaptured in 1647, Parliament tried to disband its forces, but General Fairfax and his men proclaimed that they were not a mere mercenary army and flatly refused to go home. Their job wasn't finished. The revolution had to be completed. They said it had to be established that the House of Commons was the supreme authority of England and the King was... But at the most, the chief public officer of this kingdom and accountable to this house. That was in September 1648. The Commons said, don't be so sick. The army wasn't happy with that, so it crushed Parliament. It occupied London, used St Paul's as the cavalry stables, and looted the treasury. 45 MPs were arrested, 146 were barred. The rump that remained were in effect the members chosen by the army, who would do what it wanted, which was to put Charles on trial for treason for levying war against the Parliament and Kingdom of England. 
The rump parliament, as people called it, resolved that they could make laws without the consent of the king or of the House of Lords, and then passed a law setting up a court to try the king. Charles said that he didn't recognize the court, that someone needed to explain to him what authority it possessed. On the 27th of January, 1649, this court condemned him to death. Charles was taken to the banking house, that theatrical set built by his father for dramatic presentations in which the scripts were all about the glory of royal power. It was no longer used for those masks. Charles had commissioned Rubens to make paintings for the ceilings, and they were too precious to be damaged by candle smoke. The ideology of the performances had now been put on permanent display by Rubens. The paintings celebrated James's absolute rule, casting out war and discord, bringing peace, harmony, order, and prosperity to a great people. Charles, the small, dignified, stuttering man who'd commissioned the work and presided over the reality that flowed from it, was marched out through a window onto a specially constructed platform. He wore a thick vest so that he would not shiver with cold, which might be mistaken for terror. And on that stage, he knelt with calm dignity and his head was cut off. Britain no longer had a king. A week after the execution, Charles II was proclaimed king in Scotland. But Charles I's 18-year-old son wasn't there. He was in the Netherlands. He'd fled to France with a group of supporters four years earlier, and his one brief attempt to provide military help to his father in the Second Civil War had been a failure. His object now was to find a way of recovering his father's throne, and to hell with that stuff about being an absolute monarch. He landed in Scotland in 1651 and was prepared to sign up to whatever was asked of him, including agreeing to his father's blood guilt and his mother's idolatry and becoming Presbyterian. If that's what it took to be proclaimed king, do it. The new English Republic wasn't going to stand for this. were finally defeated at Worcester. If he'd been caught, he would probably have been killed. The story of his escape, disguised as a Worcestershire yokel, became a famous legend. At one point, he spent all day hiding with a companion in an oak tree while the roundheads searched for him below. It became a celebrated story in a way that didn't bode well for the Republic. Charles looked dashing and daring, while the roundheads looked ridiculous, incompetent and heavy-handed. Throughout his six weeks' flight, he remained cheery, polite and very resourceful, ending up in the George Inn at Brighton. It's interesting that none of the three or four dozen people who recognized him were moved to betray him, either by the potential death penalty they faced or the thousand pound reward they could collect. He got away to France, then to Germany and Brussels, living in a kind of limbo, short of money and with no coherent plan of return. So how did he do it? After the execution of Charles I, England was a republic. Look at what happened to the design of the Great Seal the official mark on statutes and proclamations. Here's Charles's seal, the seal of a king. He canters on horseback with his greyhound running alongside, and the Latin motto means Charles, by the grace of God, King of Great Britain, France and Scotland, Defender of the Faith. After his execution, the New Republic was in theory ruled by the House of Commons. So instead of a king seal, the Great Seal was the seal of the House of Commons. It shows the Commonwealth, a map of Britain. And on the other side are the commons themselves. And the motto simply says, 1651, in the third year of freedom by God's blessing restored. In English. Didn't last, though, because the real power wasn't the House of Commons. It was the army. For a while, the army was too busy to take much notice of England. It was occupied with the destruction of Ireland, where a large part of the population were irredeemably loyal to Catholicism and the monarchy. But when it finally turned round and looked at England, it found that there still hadn't been a thoroughgoing Puritan revolution. So, in 1653, Cromwell, the army's most powerful general, cleared the commons at sword point and installed a new parliament, which he thought would be more capable of bringing about a revolutionary transformation of society. His own Chamber of Righteous Puritans, the so-called nominated parliament, 
turned out to be no more to his liking, and he dismissed that too, installing himself as the Lord Protector. And the Great Seal was now his own. It shows Oliver Cromwell on horseback, just like Charles, but stepping out very stately rather than cantering with a greyhound. And the mo Protector Oliver in Latin. In what sense was this a republic? However unwillingly, and he kept protesting his unwillingness, Cromwell was driven by his own belief in the divine right of revolution to run the country as a militarized kingdom for Puritan saints. There were now 11 districts, each run not by the people, but by major generals. These military ayatollahs collected taxes, ran the courts, and controlled public morality. Theatres were closed along with brothels and gambling dens. Horse racing and cockfights were banned. Everyone had to go to church, stay sober and morally upright. Pagan festivities, like Christmas, were banned. Mince pies were forbidden. Oh, it must have been great. In 1656, a newly elected parliament made it clear they wanted to return to the old constitution. They reopened the House of Lords and offered Cromwell the title of king. He seriously considered and although he turned it down, perhaps because the army would have turned against him, two years later on his deathbed, he nominated his eldest surviving son as his successor, like any other king. Very few people cheered Lord Protector Richard Cromwell. Who was he? Not crowned, not acclaimed, not the leader of an army. People called him Tumble Down Dick, and that's pretty much what happened. Early in in 1660, one of his father's commanders, General Monk, seized London and summoned a special parliament to invite Charles II to return to the throne. If you're going to have a king, it might as well be one with the right credentials. Tumble down Dick became a private citizen. He changed his name and became a lodger in Cheshunt. Thirty years later, he wrote to his daughter that his safety was to be retired, quiet, and silent. He would have made a good constitutional monarch. While the English may not have been quite sure what they did want, they now knew exactly what they didn't want. Anything run by soldiers or Puritans. No matter what else would happen in the world, England would never again let a military man have any political power. And a deep and abiding suspicion has been created of anyone who looks like a revolutionary or a religious enthusiast. Actually, this explains a lot of English history. Most countries were at some time in the last 300 years infected by revolutionary fervor or ideological passion. But England, it seems, has been vaccinated. It's been pretty much immune to political feverishness. Still is, I think. Charles was really a very popular king. His manner was light and easy, his court dissolute and cheerful. His sexual enthusiasm was generous and very, very unpuritan. As those great historians Sellers and Yeatman put it in 1066 and all that, not so much a king, more a monarch. The years since his father's execution were called the Interregnum, and the idea was to pretend that nothing much had really happened. The parliamentary records for those years were torn up. An act of Parliament gave the new king control of the armed forces, and Parliament agreed to give him an inadequate annual revenue. Ten of the people who'd been involved in the execution and trial of Charles I were themselves put on trial, and then hanged, drawn, and quartered. Cromwell and three other military commanders of the Parliamentary Army were also put on trial. They didn't put up a very convincing defence, being dead. Their bodies were dug up and hung in chains at Tyburn, it was all good, popular entertainment, and theatres reopened and maypoles were back in business. Merry England had been restored. Charles had given a written promise of pardons, arrears of army pay, and what was called liberty of tender consciences in religious matters. He also confirmed land purchases made during the interregnum, which helped maintain stability, but was a bit of a blow to cavaliers who'd lost their wealth and their land by being on the wrong side. In a way, the sense of a new beginning was strengthened by the destruction of the capital, plague and fire. 
plague was a swift and grotesque disease, which had erupted frequently before, but in 1665 it took a firm grip and killed about 20% of the city's population. London was largely turned into a ghost city as the survivors fled. The king, who'd moved to Hampton Court, gave a thousand pounds a week to London charity. And then, London began to burn. The king returned to the city with his brother James, the Duke of York, to take personal charge of firefighting in the streets. Everyone knew that the mayor had been too timid to pull down houses that might have created fire breaks until he was directly ordered to do so by Charles. It certainly helped the royal image, though it didn't help London much. The old, rotting, disease structure was purified by an inferno that simply burned the place away as thoroughly as if it had been blasted by a nuclear weapon, and a lot more cleanly. And the new city that arose was a classic image of the political settlement of the restored monarchy. The old arcades was rejected. That was the sort of Renaissance princely city that existed on the continent. They were the stages on which state ceremonies could be impressively performed by grand leaders, not needed. Wren was allowed to build a new modern cathedral and a swathe of churches in which altar, pulpit and congregation are positioned to be equally important. Not too Roman Catholic, not too Puritan. But the old street plan was retained. Everyone could rebuild their own place on their own plot and the narrow streets and little alleys of medieval London that still existed in everyone's memories regrew from the ashes. Even now, neither German bombs nor modern developers have quite destroyed them. There mustn't be another fire. Laws would insist on flat fronts, no overhangs, more brick. But the old city that had no overall plan, not even a basic map, reappeared with modern improvements designed not for a new life, but for a better continuation of the old one. Exactly. There was a general desire to better continue things as they had once been, rather than invent something new or imitate something foreign. There was one other marker in the rebuilt London that showed what kind of country this now was. This fine column. It marks the site where the fire had begun. It shows the destruction of the city. There's Charles surrounded by liberty, genius and science giving directions for its restoration. And there was originally an inscription explaining that the fire had been deliberately begun by papists. In order to the carrying on their horrid plot for extirpating the Protestant religion and our English liberty, and the introducing popery and slavery. It was nonsense, but a French watchmaker was hanged for his part in the non-existent plot. Robert Hubert. He wasn't in London when it happened. There was a pathological fear of papists. Awkward. Charles had a pension from the King of France given when he'd promised to convert to Roman Catholicism. The trick to being a king in this situation was, Charles understood very well, not to say exactly what his job was. There was a parliament, and it was beginning to form parties, one pro-monarch, one anti. But parliament didn't actually rule the country. That was done by the king's ministers, a kind of cabinet government, referred to as a cabal, which meant that Charles wasn't seen as entirely responsible for things going wrong, which they quite often did. The Earl of Rochester wrote a mock epitaph on Charles's bedchamber door. He said a foolish thing, nor ever did a wise one. Charles saw it next morning and said, quite right, my words are my own, but my acts are the acts of my ministers. Charles died in 1685, 54 years old. On his deathbed, he converted to Roman Catholicism. He had no legitimate child left alive. The next in line to the throne was his brother James, who was already a Roman Catholic. This really wasn't going. James II was only three years younger than Charles II. He was the oldest man ever to have succeeded to the throne. To start with, nothing much seemed to have changed. Both brothers had led quite similar lives. Both were enthusiastic womanizers. Both seemed reasonably pragmatic. But the way James handled his first big crisis began to create alarm. The 
The restoration of the monarchy had obviously not been welcomed by everyone. In the southwest especially, Puritan religious feeling remained strong and suspicious, especially with a Roman Catholic king. Charles II had an illegitimate son, the Duke of Monmouth, who was a Protestant. Rumours began to spread that he was actually legitimate, the true heir to the throne. Monmouth came over from the Low Countries and began a rising in the southwest where he was proclaimed King Monmouth. The rebellion was crushed. James, determined to make an example of the rebels, ordered the arrest and punishment of everyone involved. At each centre, Dorchester, Taunton, Exeter, Bristol, Wells, people were rounded up, special court known as the Bloody Assize, punishing not just rebels, but anyone who was accused of even helping the wounded. Around 230 people were executed, some hanged, drawn and quartered, and about 850 were sent to labor in the West Indies for 10 years. And many more, of course, were fined and had property confiscated. And James did not disband the army that had been formed to put down the rebels. England had a standing army again, just as it had under Cromwell. And he appointed Roman Catholic officers to run it. People began to murmur, and when the House of Lords expressed discontent, he dissolved Parliament. And as he continued to appoint Roman Catholics to public and church offices, public support began to ebb away from him. At his instigation, for instance, all the fellows of Magdalen College, Oxford, were dismissed, and the college was turned into a cap. The elder girl, Mary, was married to William of Orange, ruler of the Dutch, a Protestant head of state. The heir to the throne would reverse James's whole policy. But early in 1688, James's queen gave birth to a son who would be raised as a Catholic. This was, he thought, excellent news. It made him more secure. He was wrong. It sealed his fate. Well, that and the fact that he seemed to be preparing for a joint war with Catholic France against the Protestant Dutch. And now it became evident that the Civil War really had changed the place of the King in England. He ruled by permission of Parliament, and Parliament wasn't going to put up with this one. A group of leading members of Parliament sent a secret invitation to William of Orange to save the country from a Catholic takeover by bringing them military assistance. William brought over a fleet carrying a large professional army. James tried to block it with his own fleet, but the winds were against him, and William landed unopposed in November 1688 at Tor Bay. The West Country had its own score to settle with James. And James simply panicked. The army wasn't behind him. Parliament wasn't. London wasn't. He was going the same way as Tumble Down Dick. In the middle of the night, he scurried out of Whitehall Palace by a secret passage. He got down to Sheerness, throwing the great seal into the Thames on the way. Ha! That'll fox him! It didn't fox anyone. He was captured by local fishermen. Eventually, William gave him permission to go to France, and no one had the faintest idea what to do next. William hadn't come to depose James, but to give military backing to Parliament in their quarrel with him. James had quite obviously quit, abdicated, gone, taking his son with him. England, having failed to be a republic, had failed to be a monarchy. It was a bit of a puzzler. Perhaps William should declare himself king by right of conquest. He didn't think so. Parliament wanted Mary to take the crown, James's daughter, after all. But she insisted that her husband was boss, and he didn't intend to play the Duke of Edinburgh role two paces behind the ruling lady. This short, stooping, asthmatic man with bad teeth was tough and shrewd. He was himself a grandson of Charles I and wouldn't make a humble consort. In the end, a deal was struck. They would both be sovereigns, Mr. and Mrs. King and Queen, by the invitation of Parliament. And they had to sign up to some basic rules. No standard royal power to lay down the law. The king and queen couldn't appoint or punish judges. They couldn't make war without Parliament's consent, and Parliament would decide who could have the crown. And it wouldn't be a Roman Catholic. 
all the questions posed by the Civil War were finally answered, and it was called the Glorious Revolution, because in the end, the whole basis of royal power was redefined without anyone being killed at all. Except in Ireland, of course. James, with French backing, decided to make a comeback through Ireland. It was, after all, one part of Britain where a Catholic king could expect some enthusiasm. Protestant settlers had been brought into Ulster, and they held Londonderry and Enniskillen against the Catholic regiments. Eventually, in 1690, there was a showdown between William's Anglo-Dutch Danish army and James's Franco-Irish one at the River Boyne. James was beaten in a battle which has cast a grotesquely long shadow over Ulster. The annual celebration there of the Protestant victory has never lost its 17th century passion. The irony is that this was not a religious war at all. It was a war to contain the ambitions of France, and the Pope was actually firmly on the side of William of Orange. The Vatican was more anti-French than it was anti-Protestant. The Orange men at the Battle of the Boyne were actually fighting for the Pope as well as King Billy. And Billy, of course, was not exactly English. His native tongue was Dutch. William, a serious man, ended up spending much of his time on the continent. So, in effect, Mary did become the sovereign of England. But at the end of 1694, she died of smallpox. England was now in effect ruled by an oligarchy through Parliament. The king had a role, but by no means a commanding one. Part of that role, as he saw it, was to push forward religious tolerance in a fundamentally intolerant... Tolerance does have its limits. At his death in 1702, the question of the succession had already been agreed and settled. The crown passed to Mary's sister, Anne. Anne was married, as Mary had been, to a foreign prince, but her husband, Prince George of Denmark, was no William of Orange. He was a lazy alcoholic, and while Anne was willing to let him be naturalized as an Englishman and notional head of the army and navy, she was queen and he was a subject. No marriage was very keen on the ceremonial and quasi-magical position of royalty, holding ceremonies where she touched people with scrofula, swollen neck glands from tuberculosis. It was called the king's evil, and the power to cure it was supposedly the magical sign of true royalty. She was the last monarch to try it. Kings had male favourites, Anne had female favourites. The first and closest was Sarah Churchill, the wife of the Duke of Marlborough. They called each other by pet names. The Queen was Mrs Freeman, Sarah was Mrs Morley. Mrs Morley's husband was England's leading military commander, and the architect of a stunning victory at the Battle of Blenheim that placed England in a dominant position in Europe. But England's queen did not decide who to fight or when to fight or how to fight. Politics was no longer really her business. Even when in 1707 England and Scotland were formally and permanently united by the Act of Union, it was not Anne's doing, but Parliament's. Anne did, it was true, refuse to sign one Act of Parliament at around that time, but it was a very minor technical issue, not a real challenge to the power of the politicians. Her life was spent more playing cards, chatting, being ill, and having 19 pregnancies. These pregnancies were watched with fascination by an elderly lady in Hanover, Sophia, the Electress Duchess of Brunswick-Lüneburg. She was James I's granddaughter, and because there were so few Protestants of the blood royal left alive, she was, by act of Parliament, next in line to the throne, if Anne died childless, and if she lived long. One by one, Anne's pregnancies came and went, 14 miscarriages and stillbirths, five live births, but by the time Anne was widowed in 1708, all of them were dead. Sophia, aged 78, now just had to outlive the 43-year-old Anne to become Queen of England. Anne was a sick woman. Sophia was tough as an old boot. She knew she could do it. But in 1714, Sophia received an outrageous letter from Anne. Anne had somehow got the impression 
that Sophia was going to secretly send her son George to England in some kind of plot, and she told Sophia that would not be allowed. Sophia, now 84, was shocked, and the shock killed her, just nine weeks before Queen Anne died. Sophia had failed, but her son George would now be king. In theory, a very weak constitutional monarch, but that hardly explains why 65 years later, English men launched a new war against royal tyranny and thousands were killed. England's royalty hadn't exactly packed up and disappeared. But the story of what they had done will have to wait for the next episode. Lust and madness loom large in the colourful reigns of the Georgians tonight at 10 o'clock. And to do a quick historical quiz about the Stuarts, Sky Digital View, Press Red. Hardware coming up on UK TV history, the Hawker Hurricane and the aircraft carrier, decisive weapons.
silver coming to Europe from the New World had created inflation, reducing the real value of that income. Medieval government was designed for rather static farming economies and vast estates. Towns, run by common folk with special liberties granted in charters, had been useful little add-ons. But now international and intercontinental trade had blossomed. The nobles had declined, the towns had become major financial centers. Inflation, the growth of Protestantism, a lack of respect for traditional authority, the emergence of assertive members of parliament, none of this was restricted to England. But in England it had a slightly different flavor. Everywhere else the ruler made the law, he was the law, but not in England. Kingship existed under the law. James simply didn't understand this. He was certain that the job of king meant being above the law. And being James, he not only understood this was the problem, but said so as a matter of principle. And when the Lord Chief Justice disagreed, the Lord Chief Justice got the sack. James was, people said, the wisest fool in Christendom.